Uh, I'm sure that this is going to be a very fruitful hour with good uh, outcomes. I wish you all, all the best. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, now I request uh, Dr. Mayil to take over and uh, start the presentation. Dr. Mayil, I just want to make your hands so that you can share. Sir, so I'll start with my screen sharing, uh, Dr. Avinash. Are my slides visible? Yes. Yes, yes I like so thank you, ma'am, uh, for that introduction, ma'am. Uh, it is an honor for me to be here, ma'am. It is a real honor. I just hope in the next half an hour or so, I'll be able to deliver something which uh, the PGs will find relevant from their examination point of view also. And in case they wish to do a research in genetics, at the outset, ma'am, I'm not a geneticist. I've been taking lectures on genetics for 10, 12 years now. I've been covering up the basics of genetics. And the reason I have been covering up these basics basically is, ma'am, that uh, I have found that PG students tend to run away from this topic. The moment this thing comes as an essay question or even a normal question is asked, everybody tries to avoid this topic. So many a times we are not aware of the extent and the potential of this particular topic. So uh, the purpose of the talk basically is to give an overview, overlay, basically an overview of the topic so that everybody feels that it is something which we can incorporate in our curriculum. So I bring to you greetings from Swami Vivekanand Subharti University. Ma this is my workplace. And our vision is basically Siksha, Seva, Sanskar and Rashtriyata. Especially that Rashtriyata, nationality is something which we incorporate in our day-to-day -day practices. We basically ensure that ultimately we don't say good morning, good evening. We greet either, each other by saying Jai Hind only in our college ma'am. This is our university, ma'am, and uh, the vision basically has been, uh, this is how our private uh, university is different from other universities. Dr. Atul Krishna and Dr. Mukti Bhatnagar, ma'am, general surgeon and, and MD medicine. So they were the ones who started this university. And finally, their daughter, Dr. Shalya, she is an endodontist. She is the one who is the CEO of the university right now. And again, ma'am, it is not a standalone university. It contains 19 different colleges. So it is like a mini city outside the city of Meerut or on the outskirts of Meerut, in which uh, I've been working for 19 years now. This was the first college. It opened in 1996. And um, it, the, the dynamic leadership of Dr. Nikhil Shevastav, sir, this particular college has been reaching new heights. And I've been working here since uh, April 2005. So when I completed my post-graduation from GDC Nagpur and whatever I am today, it is because I had a godly figure as my guide and HOD, Dr. R.K. Altivar sir. So we call ourselves Altivar sir's family. I am currently the head of the Department of Odontology and Implantology in Subhartina. And I am basically an implantologist. So um, we have the largest hospital in Meerut, Lokpriya Hospital, which comes under Subharti University. And there I'm the chief mentor along with Dr. Rohit, who is uh, Dr. Shalya's husband, the CEO of the university, and Dr. Sumit Makkad, a prostorontist, and Dr. Prajesh Dubey, an oral surgeon. So this is where we actually teach general dentists how to place implants. Okay. And I'm, uh, I'm a practitioner. Uh, last 19 years, I've been practicing in Kaushik's dental care with my papa. He's a general dentist and my wife. Dr. Nupur, she is a professor in the Department of Pedodontics. Uh, this is our small world, a uh, 12-year-old daughter, Adya, and this is our puppy, Fluffy. So this is a little bit about myself, ma'am. Uh, again, ma'am, uh, thanks a lot for the honor, and thanks a lot for the excellent gathering, ma'am. So when Sheila, ma'am, had told that a seminar would be there, so I, I had said yes straight away, and, uh, but ma'am wasn't well in between. I just hope, ma'am, you are better now. So I had not expected that a huge gathering and everybody would be sitting in this big hall, ma'am. So it is a real honor for me uh, to have this platform with all of you, ma'am. Uh, so, ma'am, starting with the topic, genetics. Ma'am, uh, the basic thing about genetics, the basic concepts and its correlation with not just periodontal disease, that is the disease we will be covering with uh, in detail. It is in general about dentistry. The issue with genetics is that... Uh, this is a topic 
which even though we have been studying right from our 11th standard, this is a topic which we tend to avoid at times. So the basic purpose of taking these lectures are that at least the outline has to be clear in our mind. It should be clear that what this topic is about and what all uh, can be right and do research in this topic. So I'll be covering up this thing in four basic parts, this talk of mine. And the first part would be a basic concept, whatever we have read in our 11th and 12th standard, etc. I'll be covering up that thing first. So first and foremost, starting with the basic concepts. So basic concept, if we say that uh, as a pedontal surgeon, is genetics related to pedontal disease or not? So pedontal disease is broadly divided into gingivitis and periodontitis. So with regard to gingivitis, all of us remember the classical gingivitis study of Lou et al. In this, basically a group of subjects, they stopped brushing for a period of 21 days. So all of them developed gingivitis, bleeding gums, etc. So they came to the conclusion that gingivitis, just the gum inflammation as such, is not something which is actually related to the genetic makeup much. It is a universal phenomena. Everybody will develop gingivitis in case oral hygiene measures are not followed. However, when the same study was extended, instead of three weeks to roughly six months or so, Lindy et al., not everybody developed periodontitis, that is bone loss. So that is when they realized that periodontitis definitely has a genetic component. So the reason for that, why periodontitis is not universal, why it is affected by the immunity of an individual, and this is one thing which I'll be repeating in my presentation again and again, immunity and genetics are interlinked. The reason for this thing that is that the stand. very first stage of pocket formation, that is destruction of, uh, uh, this is Charita Cherry, if you could switch off the mic once, uh, um, Mrs. Cherry, Dr. Cherry, okay. So uh, the very first stage of pocket formation, the destruction of connective tissue fibers below the junctional epithelium, this is the first step in pocket formation. This is actually related I request Dr. Ah, Charita Cherry, uh, Dr. Charita Cherry, if you could uh, switch off the mic once, if possible. Sir, Dr. Can Cherry. Sir, can you yeah. go so that I can uh, you know the people who are speaking? Uh, uh, yeah. You have a complete course. So if you can just make uh, a dental college as a uh, co-host, we'll be able to... Okay, answer. okay. Perfect. So I am supposed to mute everybody, right? Yes. Uh, that's it. Okay, okay, ma'am. Okay, ma'am. So, uh, basically, as I was mentioning, so when it comes to the first stage of periodontitis, pocket formation, this destruction is actually dependent on the genetic makeup of an individual. So, periodontitis is definitely related to uh, genetic makeup. And in that also, out of chronic periodontitis and aggressive periodontitis, it is the aggressive periodontitis which has a strong genetic component. In fact, as given by Lang et al., in the primary features, features which have to be present for us to give a diagnosis of aggressive periodontitis, familial aggregation of cases is a must. So now the problem is uh, solved. The question is cleared. Gingivitis doesn't have much of a uh, genetic component. Periodontitis definitely have a genetic component in that also we have mainly aggressive periodontitis which has a genetic component. But the issue is the moment we come across terms like gene polymorphism, mutation, segregation, major gene, modifying gene, etc. That is where we tend to get confused. So the rule is simple. We have to start with the basics and then move on to slightly advanced stuff. So, with regard to the historical background, the basics of genetics, we have to remember that genetics is basically the science of heredity, genes and variation. Why are we different from each other? Why are our looks different? Why our personality, our IQ is different? And why ultimately our, uh, let's say, response to disease is different? How our resistance of the body varies? This study is genetics. 
the word genetic uh, is is from the greek word genetikos which means genesis or origin and these are universal to all living organism genes are not just in human beings they are in animals and plants also when we talk about humans we call it medical genetics so one thing which we have to remember is that ultimately uh, plants also have genes in fact the first few studies just a couple i'll be telling were actually done with regard to plants so uh, whenever we are talking about the father of genetics gregor mendel his study was on the pattern of inheritance in garden peas so plant studies actually initiated this genetic studies in general william bateson was the one actually who gave the term genetics much later so mendel didn't give the term it was given by william bateson and that too again in a plant hybridization conference in london in 1906 later on thomas hunt morgan was the one who told that how or what are the things which actually carry these genes that is chromosomes and what can go wrong with the gene that is mutation that was given by thomas hunt morgan so what is this mutation that also i'll be covering up frederick Fe uh, griffith he was the one who told that one person can transfer characteristics from one person to another based on this genetic material what is this genetic material which can cause transfer of characteristics from one individual to another individual this was identified as dna by avery mcloyd and mccarthy and finally the main study watson and crick model who actually found out the structure of dna so with this study it revolutionized the research in genetics so ultimately after this study what happened was two major technologies the ones which i'll be discussing in the last section of the talk with regard to genetics recombinant dna technology and polymerase chain reaction came into the picture and after these technologies it was only a matter of time that genetics no longer remained something which is uh, was not clear to all the researchers rather what happened was human genome project each and every gene in the body was identified and it was completed in the year 2003 in small countries like iceland and estonia we have the entire genetic data bank of all the individuals which is stored with the government so imagine imagine a small crime occurring and the criminal leaving some hair or something at the crime scene simply by analysis of that hair the crime can be solved that is the potential of genetic research a crime free society but what are these chromosomes genes and dna again just 5 minutes i'll be taking on the very basics of genetics so all of us are aware of the basic process of fertilization that egg fertilizes with sperm female egg with male sperm and it forms a fertilized egg which contains 46 chromosomes and from this fertilized egg all the cells of the body are uh, arising which contain 46 chromosomes other than sex chromosomes so basically what happens is all the 46 chromosomes they are arranged in 23 pairs are present in the nucleus of each and every cell each and every autosome everything is present all 46 chromosomes are present in each and every cell of a living being so this basically these chromosomes contain something known as genes what are genes we'll just uh, touch it right now but each and every cell nucleus actually contains 30000 to 40000 genes that is the um, quantity of genes present so these chromosomes 46 chromosomes are actually present in uh, as pairs 23 pairs so 22 are autosomes and two are sex chromosomes in males xx and we have xy in females so once we have taken care of this thing this is how a chromosome looks like so again all of us are aware of this thing a chromosome basically has two short arms and two long arms which are joined together at the center point known as centromere the short arms are known as p p basically is derived from the french term petite which means small 
and Q is basically just the next alphabet after P, hence they call it QR. But here, from here onwards, the first confusions start. The confusions start that uh, if this is a chromosome, then what is this? This particular entity has just one short arm and one long arm. If this is a chromosome, so is this a pair of chromosome? So this is the first thing that we have to understand that both of them are chromosomes. You can encounter both of them if you are doing a genetic research. Whether a chromosome has two arms, that is one short arm, one long arm, or four arms, two short arms and two long arms, that basically depends on the stage of the cell cycle when you are examining the chromosome. Meaning, if you are examining it any time after S phase of cell cycle, that is the synthetic phase, you will end up encountering a chromosome with four arms. And in case you are uh, checking it before the synthetic phase, you will end up incorporating a chromosome, you are examining a chromosome with two arms. So even this are 23 pairs of chromosomes and these are 23 pairs of chromosomes. As long as the arms are connected by a centromere, it is just one chromosome. Irrespective of whether a chromosome contains two arms or four arms, it actually contains a very long thread known as DNA inside the chromosome. How long? A chromosome is just 0 0.004 millimeter long. The DNA, the thread inside the chromosome is 4 centimeter long. That is almost 10,000 times the length of the chromosome. So imagine the amount of coiling which has been done, how highly coiled this structure would be. So this is about chromosome. Now chromosomes vary in length based on something known as base pairs. I'll just touch up base pairs also. But as of now, please remember that the smallest chromosome is Y and the largest human chromosome is one. So the length of the chromosome varies. Chromosomal analysis is known as karyotyping. Karyotyping basically means that we are not only doing the quantitative assessment of chromosome, that is the number of chromosomes, etc. The qualitative assessment, the length of the chromosome, number of arm, position of centromeres, etc. Specific banding patterns. All that is analyzed in karyotyping. So when we talk about banding, all of us have heard about G bands. So G bands basically is short for GIMSA bands. GIMSA bands means a particular stain is used GIMSA for staining the chromosome. And then it is treated with trypsin enzyme. And we end up getting these light and dark bands in the chromosome. So this we are just supposed to remember it because we should be knowing that this is how chromosomes are identified or they are studied. Other than G bands, we have Q bands, quinacrine, ultraviolet, fluorescent micro, uh, light microscope, R bands and C bands also. But the mo most commonly used in research are G bands. So if these are chromosomes, what is a G? Inside the chromosome, that thread, DNA, a portion of that thread, which codes for a particular amino acid, this is the main function of uh, genes to synthesize proteins. So one particular stretch of that thread, which codes for a particular amino acid is known as G. So gene is a small stretch of DNA. So the next question would be, what is DNA? So DNA structure also, all of us are aware, it is like a twisted lad ladder. So it is composed of something known as nucleotide. Nucleotide means we used to remember it as SBP, sugar, base, and phosphate. Three constituents of our genetic makeup, DNA. Now, DNA is like a ladder, twisted ladder. So, we have the vertical arms of the ladder and we have the horizontal arms of the ladder. These vertical arms are made up of sugar and phosphate. Entire DNA was SBP, sugar and phosphate, and they are bound with very strong phosphodiester bonds. So nothing usually goes wrong easily with these vertical arms of the ladder. However, the horizontal arms of the ladder are consisting of nitrogenous bases. So these nitrogenous bases are the ones which are actually connected with weak hydrogen bonds. We have at CG, adenine to thymine by two hydrogen bonds. 
साइटोसिन बाय ग्वाइनाइन बाय थ्री हाइड्रोजन बॉन्ड सो दिस इज वेयर प्रॉब्लम्स अराइज इन जीन्स मीनिंग इधर दिस थिंग ब्रेक्स or this position gets changed where a was supposed to be present g is present or c is present and accordingly the complementary nitrogenous base also changes so again we don't have to go into the details one thing which we have to understand is that if we have to draw a diagram in a uh, in our examination we just have to tell that the vertical arm sugar and phosphate will remain more or less the same it is the horizontal arms which either they get broken easily or they get replaced where a was supposed to be present c is present and then accordingly the complementary base also would be different so this is where changes occur in the gene and basically what a gene does is transcription and then translation meaning dna is converted into rna first mrna known as transcription and then mrna is converting uh, gets converted into amino acids protein synthesis so the synthesis of amino acids from mrna would be known as translation so once we have just revised this 12th knowledge then we move on to what we study at the post graduate level so these are all things that we know that uh, dna is used as a template for protein synthesis and proteins are the building blocks of our body structural as well as functional if my finger is not breaking like this that is because of collagen if i am eating a normal food and that food is getting let's say absorbed etc or my body is functioning that functioning of the body is because of enzymes so even collagen is a protein the structural component enzymes are proteins so entire thing our body is dependent on proteins for the structural as well as the functional uh, mechanism now this is the part which we haven't read in 12th standard so this is given in linde so this i have taken directly from linde textbook of odontology that a gene is further divided into pc promoter component co uh, promoter region and coding region so promoter region basically means that the nucleotide bases adenine thymine cytosine etc they are not arranged in groups of 3 if they are arranged in groups of 3 that is the coding region this groups of 3 combination of three nucleotide bases together is known as codon so promoter region of a gene is sort of the initiator of protein synthesis finally the quality of protein and the quantity of protein is determined by the coding region so that is the re uh, these are the two regions you are supposed to know firstly the functional differences transcription starting promoter region later on the entire thing protein uh, regulation synthesis is by coding region first thing secondly in promoter region the codons are not arranged in groups of 3 they are arranged in groups of 3 in the coding region so we don't have zero exactly but uh, the location is minus for a nitrogenous base in promoter and it is plus for coding region so this genetic code is always read in triplets triplet means three bases usually occur together the nitrogenous bases occur in groups of three together that is known as codon or triplet or genetic code okay two other terms i'll just cover up these are loci and alle l for loci l for location so as we know chromosomes come in pairs so generally what happens is wherever a particular gene is present the location of the gene on long arm short arm of a particular uh, chromosome is known as loci allele basically means that normally a particular type of gene is supposed to occur in this sequence only any variation in that sequence is known as allele allele is a variant gene that is allele allele means variation in the sequence if the genes at both the loci that is the location in a pair of chromosomes are the same genes are having the same sequence it is known as homozygous if sequence is different in both the locations we call it heterozygous okay genotype means genetic makeup phenotype basically means that how we appear physically because of the genes as such so many a times this thing becomes confusing the chromosome location here is 7q31.2 
So seven is chromosome number. Q means it is present on the long arm of the chromosome. Three basically is region. One is band and two is subband. How do we identify these bands, subbands, etc. Based on Giemsa staining, G bands. Okay. So this is one thing which we have to understand. So each chromosome has thousands of genes, thirty to forty thousand. Most of these are common to all human beings. How much common? All of us sitting in this hall basically have ninety nine point nine percent DNA is identical. It is just point one percent which is different, which is giving different uh, appearances to us, which is actually making us uh, having different IQ and different uh, resistance. Uh, that is strength or weaknesses to various diseases. Rather, in case four percent would have been different, that is the closest that we have to our ancestors. That is apes. So, like this one was about the basic concept, just the terminologies, just the terminology, a brush up of our twelfth knowledge. So, with this, we move on to the next part. That is periodontitis, a genetic disorder. Now, this is the most important section. of the discussion because half of the time we are actually not aware of the types of genetic disorders three types of genetic disorders anybody asks us types of genetic disorders we straight away start saying autosomal dominant autosomal recessive etc no those are sub types so please understand there are three types of genetic disorders single gene or monogenic or mendelian disorders we don't follow mendel's laws now chromosomal disorders and we have non mendelian or complex disorders okay so what is the meaning of these three terms please understand a basic uh, problem which i face whenever i am checking as an examiner the uh, let's say answer of a post graduate student who has attempted a question on genetics what they do is they have taken up this topic let's say as a major question or something and they start elaborating on the diseases amelogenesis imperfecta is a genetic disorder they start telling the clinical features of amelogenesis imperfecta not at all that is not the question we are supposed to tell the genetic basis of the disease we are not supposed to tell the clinical features of the disease are you getting my point there is a difference we say down syndrome we start describing down syndrome no please understand you have to understand the meaning of these three terms basic and that is what the examiner is expecting from you is the basic clear or not okay so please understand single gene disorder basically means that out of those thousands of genes something has gone wrong with a single gene and that is sufficient enough to cause disease might be functional or phenotypic or both so what can go wrong with a gene as already covered the long arms the vertical arms will remain the same sugar phosphate phosphodiester bond but in the horizontal arms substitution occurs where the position at this position adenine was supposed to be present maybe cytosine is present that adenine would have bound to thymine now cytosine would be binding to guanine so this substitution is something which goes wrong in single gene disorders and that causes disease as such okay what is goes wrong we call it mutation so i don't know about the current generation but uh, during our times there was a movie series which used to be very famous known as uh, x men so i don't know how many of you might be remembering students can you raise the hands if you have seen any logan etc so none of you have seen okay so few hands i can see as such so at least few of you have seen so in this basically uh, who was he what was his name do you remember logan basically had the characteristic that he used to have wound healing characteristics she storm she could control the weather you are not feeling like going to college today and uh, you could make rains and thunder storms come and the exam would be cancelled or you know, the college would be closed you know boon for students so and he basically he could control the mind basically of everybody imagine you being able to control the mind of the faculty you have few sets of questions in mind and the faculty are asking only those questions so see the basic difference uh, between this movie series that is real life and real life is all of them had a genetic mutation 
But in this me- movie series, we were made to believe that that mutation gives us superpowers. It actually makes us stronger. Unfortunately, in real life, that is not the case. Mutation that is a sequence of nucleotide bases that is altered doesn't make us stronger. It can actually produce disease. What are the things which can happen in mutations? We have basically point mutation or frame shift mutation. Point mutation means a single nucleotide base has been replaced by another base. Okay, The sequence has changed. This is much more common. Frame shift means a group of nucleotide bases have been shifted and a new group has come. This is rare. In point mutation also based on the effect, three subtypes are there. We have missense mutation. Missense mutation basically means that it is the quality of protein which is altered. A different type or a defective protein is produced. Okay? Nonsense mutation means it is the quantity of protein produced which is affected. The enzyme was required in this much quantity, less is produced or inflammatory mediator was required in only this much quantity, this much is produced. And silent mutation basically means that even though the genetic makeup has altered, no effect is there on the protein. Now, these are mutations. Now, many a times what happens is we get confused between this and SNP, single nucleotide polymorphism. So again and again, Please understand, please understand, uh, in both the genetic thing which is happening is the same. One nucleotide base is getting replaced by another nucleotide base. But the difference between a polymorphism and a mutation is that polymorphism doesn't necessarily lead to disease formation, disease occurrence till the time some environmental factor is there. Mutation, on the other hand, simply the presence of that genetic defect is sufficient to cause the disease. So mutation, just a nucleotide sequence was changed and that resulted in disease. Polymorphism, the same thing happened. But till the time some environmental factors, smoking, plaque calculus, etc. is not there, no disease would be present. In the first category of genetic disease, diseases, we end up getting mutations. Mutations, after mutations, these are divided into three types, the single gene disorders. They are divided into autosomal dominant, autosomal recessive and X-linked trait. What that means basically is autosomal dominant means that that mutation, that defective gene was present on just one of the chromosomes in a pair of chromosomes. And that itself was strong enough to cause the disease. This is autosomal dominant. We have examples, cleidocranial dysplasia, dentinogenesis imperfecta, etc. So please understand, the examiner is not asking you clinical features of these diseases. Examiner is asking you what are genetic disorders. Okay. So please remember, autosomal dominant means it is present on only one. Okay. The next thing is autosomal recessive. So autosomal recessive means that if it is present in only one, the defect in the gene, it cannot cause any disease. But if it is present in both, it is a weak defect, then only disease would be present. That is autosomal recessive. The defective gene has to be present on both the chromosomes in a pair of chromosomes. So these are the examples. I'll just rush up because... Ma'am has already left. So before everybody starts getting up and leaving uh, one by one with a phone on the uh, ear or something. So I'll just try to wind it up in the next 15-20 minutes as such. So single gene disorders, X-linked traits basically means that the defect is actually present on the sex chromosomes. So these are the examples of X-linked traits. So syndromic forms of periodontitis. The first category of periodontal disorders which come under this single gene disorders are the periodontitis which are associated with papillon left fever syndrome, Ehler Danlos syndrome, Chidiac Higashi syndrome, etc. What that means is that in these cases, even in the absence of plaque and calculus, ample destruction of the periodontal apparatus will be there. Plaque and calculus are not essential for the causation of disease in these individuals. So, where do they fit in the earlier classification? Not chronic, not aggressive. 
they used to come as manifestation of systemic diseases however in the newer classification they have a separate category of genetic and developmental disorders okay so this much part is clear how many types of genetic diseases are there three the first one was single gene something going wrong with a single gene in one chromosome causing the disorder chromosomal disorders chromosomal disorders basically means that nothing is wrong with the genes as such the sequence of the nucleotide bases remains the same but the quantity of chromosomes either overall the quantity is more or if it is it is less generally it is more so how many were the total chromosomes which are present 46 so instead of 46 if we have 47 chromosomes that comes under chromosomal disorders the most common being trisomy 21 popularly known as down syndrome it is in chromosome pair number 21 instead of two chromosomes if we have three chromosomes it is a very uh, uh, let's say dangerous disease known as down syndrome we have other disorders also trisomy 18 13 the sex chromosomes also might have extra sex chromosomes but the issue is the diseases produced are not that uh, significant so this was about chromosomal disorders now we come to the last category of genetic diseases mendelian disorders or also known as complex genetic diseases so in this category the defect is the same as the first category something went wrong with a single gene the sequence was altered the only difference is it is polymorphism rather than mutation meaning the genetic defect on its own cannot cause the defect till the time some environmental risk factor is there for example we have orofacial clefts squamous cell carcinoma and pedontal disease what that means is having the genetic defect increases the chances of us developing the disease but till the time risk factor is not there environmental exposure is not there that person won't end up developing the disease for example you must have seen like many a times people keep on smoking for a lifetime chewing uh, tobacco for a lifetime and they don't end up getting any cancer carcinoma etc but few people even for a shorter duration if they do it they end up getting that carcinoma so the reason for that basically is that ultimately what happens is because of the genetic defect. So is it fine? So this is the thing which I am seeing. Uh, all the PGs are still sitting. I can see. But that might be because Sheila ma'am is sitting, right? So is it fine if I continue ma'am for another 10 more minutes so that the main portions are also covered? Okay. So the majority has been covered. And I'll just take them 10 more minutes before they also start going off as such. So I'll just move on. So now, finally, this particular section. Gene polymorphisms associated with periodontitis. What are the things uh, which we are supposed to write in the answer? Because of which periodontitis develops in a genetically prone individual. So we have understood what can be genetically prone. Now let us see with regard to periodontitis in particular. Okay, So when I talk about periodontitis, the genes are major gene and modifying gene. What that means is major genes means type 1, three types of genetic disorder, single gene disorder. The presence of the gene itself can cause periodontal bone loss okay so in such category of patient nothing much can be done implants should never be done straight away at least the conventional implants modifying genes basically means the third category genetic defect is present but till the time environmental factor plaque calculus smoking etc is not there it won't be causing bone loss so in this category please understand these are the seven enzymes or inflammatory mediators or receptors in which if genetic defect is there we end up getting periodontal disease so one thing again i would like to emphasize to all the students immunity and genetics are interlinked till that time you are not able to explain or understand immunity you won't be able to express genetics immunity we say is a double-edged sword an optimal amount is good anything excessive or if it is deficient that is harmful 
So all these things are based on either increase in immunity or, or they are uh, based on decrease in immunity. The first two increase in immunity is there. Increase in immunity exactly is in a uh, right term. What that means are that these inflammatory mediators were supposed to be produced in a small quantity. But what happened is because of the genetic defect, even a small amount of plaque and calculus actually cause surplus secretion of these inflammatory mediators leading to more bone loss. So the most commonly studied category are interleukins. They actually come under cytokines. So cytokines, another term would be local hormones. What that means basically is these are hormones which are produced locally. They exert their effect. Many are there and they have something known as biological redundancy. That is overlapping functions are there. The most commonly studied of these local hormones, cytokines are interleukins. So interleukins, many interleukins are there based on the source from the cells which they are produced as well as they have these interleukins with various functions. But a more practical classification would be pro-inflammatory cytokines and anti-inflammatory cytokines. Meaning if these cytokines are produced in a surplus quantity, more destruction would be there. If these cytokines are produced in a surplus quantity, they would be protective in nature. Out of these, the most commonly studied interleukin is interleukin 1. So interleukin 1, many genes are there, in particular three genes. So what we are supposed to remember is, first and foremost, which chromosome contains the gene which regulates the quantity of interleukin produced? It is chromosome number 2, first thing. And again, if you want to get good marks in your examination, we as an examiner are quite uh, particular about pioneer studies. It is not humanly possible to remember the years of all the authors, but at least with regard to pioneer studies, we are supposed to write down the year. Kornman et al. 1997. This was the pioneer study on genetics. So this is one thing which was emphasized in our mind during our PG time, 2002 to 2005. Genetics question comes, you are supposed to highlight Kornman et al. 1997. So this was the pioneer. So the next thing you are supposed to write down, if you remember, is what is the genetic defect occurring? So what is the genetic effect? Basically, there has to be substitution of the nitrogenous base at a particular location in that particular gene. Which gene located on chromosome number 2? So in chromosome number 2, the genetic defect which is present is either at position minus 889 or let's say plus 4845. This I am talking about interleukin 1 alpha. So please understand, this is easy to understand. This I have taken from Linde only. Minus 889 means what? Minus means what? Promoter region or coding region? Minus is promoter region, P. Plus sign means it is located at the coding region, the defect. Okay. C2T means what? At this particular location, cytosine was supposed to be present and that is replaced by thymine. Simple as that. So if you were to remember even a single list thing, the examiner would be impressed. G2T means guanine was supposed to be present, but thymine is present. Okay. So this is a defect. These are the defects which are present for interleukin 1 alpha. And the second isoform of interleukin, interleukin 1 beta, the composite, meaning both defects are present. Genes for interleukin 1 alpha are also defective and for interleukin 1 beta are also defective. That is known as composite genotype defect. It increases the chances of tooth loss by 2.7 times. So this was again a very landmark study done by Gore et al. in 1998, which was one of the pioneer studies. Couple it up with an environmental risk factor. That is in addition to plaque and calculus, you have smoking also. The risk increases to 7.7 times. This is by Misel et al. Okay. So in your answer, even if you like write about interleukin 1 alpha in detail and TNF uh, beta also, so that is more than sufficient. So this is one thing. We have periopredict test which can detect chair side, the genetic makeup of an individual. We have interleukin 2 polymorphisms. Not much has been found with regard to these polymorphisms. Interleukin 4 and 6 also 
not associated with periodontal disease. I'll just brush up this thing interleukin 10 also. So a lot of studies have been done. But what I said was, if you want to elaborate in your answers, please elaborate on interleukin 1. The second thing which you are supposed to elaborate is TNF alpha, tumor necrosis factor alpha, a very, very important interleukin uh, uh, inflammatory mediator, which if produced in surplus quantity, it causes more destruction. Here also what you are supposed to remember is which was the chromosome on which the genetic defect was located with regard to interleukin 1? It was chromosome number 2. Here it is chromosome number 6 within MHC. MHC comes, major histocompatibility complex, comes as a separate short note. So just in a short while, I'll just tell the meaning of this also. So TNF alpha, lots and lots of, uh, let's say, uh, defects are present. Uh, we are not able to show position number minus 3031 in this lifting. But can you see which is this region of a gene? This is basically promoter region. Which is this region of the gene? Coding region. Minus promoter plus coding. So at plus 489 G2A means guanine has been substituted by adenine. So these are again photographs which I have included from Linde only. Linde, the chapter is given very nicely. Okay? And it is more associated with aggressive periodontitis. So now we'll just rush it up. The first two are examples where immunity is exaggerated. Over secretion of inflammatory mediators are there leading to more periodontal destruction. The next two or three rather, these are basically receptors. So receptors, if they are defective, what happens is immunity goes down. The ability of a body to kill the microorganisms actually reduces. And this is when what happens is that ultimately uh, the body's ability to fight goes down. More destruction would be there. So what are these FC gamma receptors? Again, FC gamma receptors are the receptors to, which are present on phagocytes to which IgG actually binds and it starts killing the microorganism. They are present on natural killer cells like macrophages, the T lymphocytes, monocytes, and mast cells. In case defect in FC gamma receptors is there because of genetic defects, ultimately the immunity tends to come down. Okay, I'll just rush up. The next defects are in toll-like receptors. So toll-like receptors, basically, these are receptors which get activated only when a breach of continuity of skin or mucosa is there. So they are the ones which actually activate the immune response once entry of microorganisms are there. 13 toll-like receptors are there, out of which we have found out that basically gene defects with regard to toll-like receptor 2 and 4 have been associated with attenuated efficacy, meaning the immunity has come down. We are not able to kill the microorganisms and that leads to exaggerated bone loss. Okay. Finally, coming to the last receptor, that is cluster of differentiation molecules. So cluster of differentiation molecules are again receptors of ligands, which actually are present on the surface, which help in identifying the microorganisms. 350 Cluster of differentiation molecules are there. Genetic defects have been found mainly with regard to CD14. Cluster of differentiation 14. In case that defect is there, it leads to more aggressive periodontitis. Now, this was reduction in immunity. This was increase in immunity. Lastly, we come to a separate short note, HLA, human leukocyte antigen. So please understand that even though in immune regulation, Lots and lots of genes are involved. Majority of the genes in humans are actually present on chromosome 6. This is true for not just humans, for all vertebrates. Majority of the genes which are helping protect our body are actually present on the short arm of chromosome 6. This collection of genes is known as major histocompatibility complex. And this is basically a complex which gets activated whenever foreign microorganisms enter our body. So MHC basically in humans is known as HLA, human leukocyte antigens. It is present in chromosome 6. 140 genes are the collection in humans on chromosome 6 short arm, which actually is concerned with immunity. So this is divided into three classes. I won't be going into the details, class one, class two, class three. But what you have to remember is 
HLA molecules can be protective also and destructive also. So this is an example where increase also can be there and decrease also can be there. For example, positive association with HLA A9. So A9 molecule protein, if it increases, more destruction would be there. On the other hand, A2 and B5, if they increase, less destruction would be there. But at least, even if you are not able to remember the details, we should be remembering the word MHC, major histocompatibility complex, collection of genes with regard to immunity. In humans, MHC is known as HLA. And with this, we come to the last, that is proteases. Proteases, as we know, are enzymes which destroy proteins. So, which are the most commonly studied proteases which come as a separate short note? MMPs, matrix metalloproteinases. So, these are the protein and enzymes which destroy majority of the proteins in our body. In this, the studied MMPs are the first MMP which comes under collagenase, that is MMP1 the ones which are destroying collagen, the first MMP under gelatinase, that is MMP2, and the first which comes under stromlysin, that is MMP3. So genetic defects have been found with regard to MMP1, 2, and 3. Okay. So again, uh, please understand, slightly this topic is vast because a lot of short notes are being covered in this topic. MMP comes as a separate short note. So, MMP1, 2 and 3 have been studied, although uh, since many enzymes are involved in periodontal destruction, we cannot say specifically that MMPs are the ones which are majorly responsible. So, mainly it is interleukin 1, TNF-alpha and we have toll-like receptor and FC gamma. So, uh, I can mute. Okay. So, I can mute. Okay. So, now I know, got to know. So now it is this thing. So this one was about what happens. And with this, we move on to the last five minutes of the presentation that we understood the terms in genetics. We read about the three types of genetic disorders, at least superficially. We got to know that what all are the genetic defects which are present, which can be present for causation of periodontal disease. But the final thing is after all this theory, as a researcher, what can we do? Can we take up a thesis on genetics? Can we do a short study in genetics from a research publication point of view? And can we apply it in our day-to-day -day regenerative surgeries that we do with regard to teeth and implants? The answer is definitely yes. Okay. So with regard to the application of genetics in periodontal research, this part is basically focused on just two aspects, okay? two techniques. So, okay, I don't know why balloons are coming. So, I'll just, um, they are coming on their own. Nothing to do with, okay, two is balloon. Okay, two is, okay. So, I won't raise two. I'll try to raise three. So three also, no balloons are coming. Okay. So, those two techniques, do you remember which I mentioned? PCR and recombinant DNA technology. Both very, very important short notes and the application is very, very important. This is the most important aspect of the presentation that how can you apply this thing to your day-to-day -day research life also and clinical life also. Okay, So please understand polymerase chain reaction. So what is this polymerase chain reaction? Polymerase chain reaction basically means that if I have to study the genetic makeup of an individual or for that matter of a virus or bacteria etc ultimately what happens is the quantity is too less of dna i have to amplify that quantity then only i'll be able to study so in order to amplify the quantity what i have to ensure is that ultimately the first step is denaturation denaturation basically means do you remember uh, I'll just try to mute somebody is there. It's not an issue. I'm not able to locate. Okay, so I'll just continue. So, uh, do you remember? It was a double helical helix. Twisted ladder was there. So, the first step in PCR is I have to split the ladder from the center. Two parts of the ladder are there. Now, we have one vertical arm with some amount of nitrogenous bases 
split in half or then uh, harm. So I'm splitting up the ladder in half. This is the first step of PCR. My ladder was split into half. One nitrogenous base was attached to the other nitrogenous base. Now both have been separated. So I have split the hydrogen bonds between the DNA. So now I have two separate single strands instead of double stranded DNA. The next step is I have to buy something known as primer for my study. Primers are specific to the DNA that you are trying to study. So in that primer thing, I buy a very small strip of single stranded DNA. And with that primer, what happens is the single strands start becoming double. And then finally, I put an enzyme DNA polymerase. And with that DNA polymerase, these two single strands of DNA actually become double strands again. Okay. So what happens is in PCR, we start with one. We split it up into two single strands. Then what we do is we attach primer. We start making them double with the help of primer. And then finally, what happens is those two strands are made double from two, four like that. It is almost like a photocopier machine from a small amount of DNA. Same DNA is amplified. This is PCR splitting in the center and then amplifying and getting same amount of DNA. So this was the step that we used to use earlier. A lot of steps are still used. Mix the contents in a tube. Then we have to put them in a thermal cycler. This was how the apparatus used to appear earlier. Manual steps were there. After the first step, annealing for primers, we had to shift it to the second. Then we had to shift it to the third. Now we have the automated PCR. Everything is done. All the three steps are done automatically. After sample collection, you just have to put it in the PCR machine. Okay? And then there is something known as agarose gel electrophoresis by which you identify what you are trying to find whether that particular DNA is present in the blood sample of this individual or not. Okay. So with regard to the types of PCR, do you remember? Uh, there are two types of PCR, real-time PCR and we have endpoint PCR. Real-time PCR basically means as the process is going on, we are able to see whether the DNA you are trying to search is present or not. Endpoint PCR means you have to wait for a couple of hours for the cycle to be complete. And then only you will be able to find out whether the DNA was present or not. Okay? But during COVID time, do you remember? I think all of us must have undergone RT-PCR. So that RT-PCR was not actually um, this thing, real-time PCR. Because we had to wait for a couple of hours for the report to come. That was reverse transcription PCR. Transcription was conversion of DNA to RNA. But COVID virus was basically a what? An RNA virus. So RNA had to be converted to DNA first. Then only amplification was possible because PCR amplifies only DNA. Are you getting a point? So RT-PCR or reverse transcription PCR was, we used to convert the RNA of COVID virus into DNA and then we used to amplify that DNA. This was known as RT-PCR, okay? These studies are not new. My co-PG, basically, Amit Agarwal had done this study, RT-PCR study, uh, PCR study, sorry, not RT-PCR study on interleukin-1 way back in 2002. So I'm sure you people must be quite small when I was in first year of PG, 2002. He had done this study in NIRI. So my thesis was not even on genetics. My thesis was basically on one of the first studies on heart tissue lasers, irbm and carbon dioxide in vitro and then in the patient's mouth. This was basically uh, one of the first few studies in India that time, heart tissue lasers. Diode we were using routinely, but carbon dioxide and irbm hardly anybody had used. But the um, this thing situation is right now that he is delivering lectures on lasers and I am delivering lectures on genetics right now. So in any case, what happened was, if you wish to do a study, ample study labs are there. This is the PCR lab that we have in Subharti. Since 19 years, I am seeing, since the time I joined here as an MDS faculty. And this is the PCR apparatus, uh, which is there in Subharti as such. Okay? Uh, we have other techniques also. Serial analysis of gene expression. This was given by Dr. Victor in John Hopkins way back in 1995. The main difference is that here, you can study the entire population together rather than concentrating on an individual. 
skin. But uh, individual PCR is better. We have a lot of advances also. Majority of them, even I am not aware. But uh, this is for future reading in case anyone of you wants to become a geneticist or something. Now, the final part of the discussion, I've been using this word final, final for the last 15 minutes now. But trust me, this is the final this thing. Okay. Because all the PG students and ma'am also just now, ma'am has um, come to the college, I think. Uh, after ma'am, I hope you are better now. So uh, this is the final this thing for everybody. Okay. So genetic manipulation. Fine. We have studied genetics. We have understood how to identify DNA. But can we do something to correct the disease? Or can we use genetics to the knowledge of genetics to enhance our uh, regenerative materials the answer is yes so in genetic uh, manipulation uh, this will last okay so just hold on i know that is the issue ma'am i really am thankful for this thing because what used to happen ma'am was uh, these online meetings whenever they used to be there so ultimately i was the only one whose camera used to be on so ultimately everybody used to join and then their camera used to be switched off so after a while we used to think that whether I'm the only person speaking to myself or not. But this arrangement, ma'am, I'm really thankful as a teacher. Quite uh, motivating for a, a teacher that everybody is sitting in a hall. Everybody is looking at the screen from what I can see. So thanks a lot, ma'am. This is what has kept us going as such. Otherwise, after a while, you ask, is anybody there? After 15 minutes, you get to hear, yes, sir when they realized that the sound has started, stopped coming out of the laptop or something. So, ma'am, thanks a lot for this arrangement. I'll just take the last five minutes, ma'am. So, this is not more genetics. This is the last part of genetics, okay? So, gene therapy basically means that we are trying to correct the defective gene. This can be either normal gene can be inserted, abnormal gene can be replaced, it can be repaired through selective reverse mutation, a regulation of the gene can be there or the researchers are still thinking that a 47th additional chromosome can be put in the body right at the time of birth, which will compensate for any genetic uh, disease later on. Imagine a cancer-free society in case genetics progresses to such an extent that ultimately nobody ends up dying of cancer. So that would be a big, big thing. Now, this thing is possible because the therapeutic gene can either be delivered through a vector, a viral vector, or it can be directly inserted. So this is a separate lecture of one hour, which I take on gene therapy, delivery, the delivery of these therapeutic genes. I'm not taking it right now. Don't worry. So the important thing here is not once the gene is corrected, now normal proteins will be produced, not defective proteins, and they would be produced in the right quantity. That is gene therapy. We say already success cases are there. Lots and lots of patients of color blindness and Parkinson's disease have been treated with gene therapy. Now, what is this gene therapy? What do they do? This is the final part of this thing. Just like PCR is used for amplification of the same DNA from a diagnostic point of view. Here, what we are doing is we are repairing the DNA. So this is known as recombinant DNA technology also known as genetic engineering. Cutting of one DNA, combining it with another DNA. So please understand this is possible because more or less the structure is the same. We said genetic makeup is more or less the same. The same twisted ladder will be present in a virus also. Um, virus might be single-stranded also. Will be present in a bacteria also. Will be present in animals also. Will be present in humans also. So what we do basically is we cut basically the ladder, the DNA from the center. So this is one thing that if you write in your answers, any examiner would be very happy that you have understood the basics. PCR, how are we splitting up the DNA? We were splitting the DNA like this. We were splitting up the DNA like this. Two single strands were produced. Okay. Now it is not in a vertical plane we are cutting. We are cutting in a horizontal plane. This DNA we are breaking like this. Now two parts are there. Both of them are double strands. So this is how a cut is there in the case of recombinant DNA technology. 
that is how a cut was there in the case of pcr in the case of recombinant dna technology we used two enzymes instead of one one for cutting one for joining so restriction endonuclease is the first enzyme by which you cut a dna into two parts and then what you do is you use another enzyme known as dna ligase what we do is we combine another dna with this dna this is known as recombinant dna technology so please understand in the case of pcr the splitting was in the center in the case of two single strands and then we were making these single strands double so we were amplifying the same dna from a diagnostic point of view here we are trying to create new dna so what we are doing is we are splitting the dna like this and we are combining it with a new dna and this thing has revolutionized at least our practice of implant for example today's evening case again i'll be placing in my clinic recombinant bmp on to my implant before placing the implant in the patient's mouth and if bone graft would be required i'll be putting bmp in that bone graft also the same technology is used for manufacturing recombinant human pdgf also so all of us are aware about tissue engineering all of us are aware about the uh, potential of growth factors so pdgf all of you must be reading on and on about platelet concentrates etc the issue with pdgf is it is secreted in a very small quantity in the body so that small quantity is not sufficient enough to promote regeneration bone formation soft tissue formation etc it is secreted by platelet so platelet is secreting only a small quantity of pdgf but imagine we were to take the dna of a platelet and we were to recombine with the dna of a bacterial cell so bacteria have a proper uh, property of replicating at a very fast rate they replicate ample number of times so ultimately what happens is once you combine this platelet dna with bacterial dna the same small quantity will be produced by a single cell but the number of cells which are dividing and forming will be quite a bit because of the characteristic property of bacterial dna so now instead of one cell producing this much of quantity of pdgf we have ample number of cells producing this much quantity of pdgf so that is how we are using uh, recombinant dna technology for getting growth factors and again each and every vaccine majority of the vaccines are produced by recombinant dna technology periodontal vaccine also was tried but the issue with periodontal vaccine was it is a multifactorial disease so it is not exactly that one microorganism can be targeted okay with this technology what we are doing is we are modifying our food stuffs so genetically modified organisms are being used in our food stuffs it has been found that gmo food stuffs genetically modified food stuffs are much more tolerant to drought resistance they have enhanced nutrients so all of you would be thinking that we should not eat uh, genetically modified food stuffs we might become mutants or something you would be surprised to know that india is actually the fifth largest producer of gmo genetically modified food stuffs in the world majority of the food stuffs that we are eating are actually genetically modified nutrigenomics i'll just end it with two terms is basically what we eat how it affects our genes so whatever we are eating cod liver oil etc that affects our genetics in the long term chances of development of diseases reduce epigenetics the final this thing is epigenetics epigenetics basically means whatever lecture that we had in the last uh, 1 hour 24 minutes actually uh, or 1 hour 20 minutes or something was basically on dna but dna is combined this thread is combined coiled around histone proteins so histone proteins any diseases which are associated with histone proteins something going wrong which are present inside the chromosome only that is known as epigenetics that is again a short note phosphorylation etc histone proteins so anything going wrong with histone proteins is epigenetics what are histone proteins these are proteins around which the thread known as dna is coiled together if you want to have a look on netflix this history 101 is present just a 20 minutes if i remember right yeah 20 minutes season in season 1 episode 10 is on genetics you can just have a look 
very briefly nicely it has explained okay so finally the slide which majority of the audience wait for actually that brings a sigh of relief conclusion slide okay so is the climb worth the view so please understand please understand we try to run away from this topic no this topic has a lot of potential it has a lot of potential from writing and attempting in the examination point of view because imagine two major questions have come choice has come or out of three you are supposed to attempt two or out of two you are supposed to attempt one so six of you are appearing for an examination and the choice is between types of bone grafts or tissue engineering and genetics naturally majority of the pgs will be attempting tissue engineering so the pg who would be attempting genetics straight away the examiner will be having respect for that pg okay this person has taken up a topic which is lesser understood and then which whatever we write meaning not exactly whatever meaning if we write relevant stuff naturally we'll be scoring more than the other pg so this is one thing second thing is from a research point of view please understand genetic pcr study if you undertake any time research publication will be there secondly clinical recombinant dna technology if you were to use growth factors routinely in your bone grafting cases recession coverage cases and your implants the results will be much better okay so rhbmp coated implant just now i had presented uh, two months back in the national conference in amritsar also and trust me the results are good and it is not that expensive also just 2750 rupees vial is available recombinant human bmp and that can be utilized for at least 2 to 3 implants minimum okay so again just the tip of the iceberg i have been able to touch lot of things i had to skip over lot of things i had to eliminate but i just hope this was the thing which i was expecting at the end but thanks to sheila ma'am so all the pgs were sitting in this huge council hall so still i can see that everybody is awake or is it a screenshot ma'am which has been put a sort of a recording which was put i think it is uh, real only can you raise your hands how many are perio pgs please raise your hands once so one or two hands i can see okay 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 so good so it is not exactly a screenshot or a screen recording and one hand has been raised in the chat section also okay so again how to this thing so thanks a lot uh, ma'am especially for this honor i just hope that all of you had something to gain any queries you have this is my whatsapp number uh, this is my email and of course uh, on instagram we tend to post our cases at any point of time if we can be of any help i can be of any help it would be an honor for me as a teacher as an academician and as a clinician thanks a lot for the honor ma'am thank you ma'am thank you Thank you, Vaughn, for coming to the class of class. An excellent and humble pleasure. And uh, I know that it's a very uh, tough topic uh, for uh, for PG students to understand. You have simplified it uh, so much that it it was easy to understand. Okay, there are a few questions if you would uh, or like to uh, take it up. Uh, this one question by Dr. Anupam. Uh, Is it possible to treat aggressive pancreatitis by gene therapy? Have any research on that? Okay, this throws some light on. Yes, sir. Sir, uh, uh, this is the question, right? If polymorphisms, okay, I'll uh, move on to the chat section. Uh, is it possible to by gene therapy? Oh, no, okay, sir. Ha, uh, sir. The first question that uh, treatment of aggressive pancreatitis by gene therapy. So, uh, what did we say that? majority of the times it is a complex genetic defect it is a modifying gene so once that thing has been corrected to a large extent the correction would be there that doesn't mean that uh, we can stop brushing all together but it has been shown that a strong genetic component is there meaning it is not the only component but if not entire correction of the disease definitely the severity of the disease can be corrected but at this time also what we are supposed to remember is whenever multi genetic components are there many different genes are involved many a times it is not possible to correct all the gene in case they are corrected definitely the overall intensity of the disease will be coming down sir if not 100% resolution 
that is one thing sir the second question sir if polymorphisms require gene alteration and uh, then if we correct the alteration but not alter them does it mean no not like that man like genetic component is basically a thing which exaggerates disease it is something in which both work in correlation it is not something to say that uh, few people can smoke for a lifetime can drink excessively for a lifetime and if they don't have any genetic this thing no uh, disease would be there disease is a broad term this is a broad term so maybe the occurrence of that particular disease would be affected uh, would be reduced but there would be other components of the body which would be affected so it is not like that alteration if possible of so many genetic disease uh, components if it is done then we can give those environmental factors in surplus quantity not at all the check on the risk factors like smoking etc has to be done because just like we have multiple genes involved in the causation of periodontitis similarly smoking also works through multiple mechanisms one of those mechanisms is genetics so both a balance in life has to be maintained okay? and as of now correction of the genetic level of multiple genes is not been accomplished the reason for that is it would almost be like somebody's baldness has been corrected somebody's eye color has been changed somebody's complexion has been changed it is not possible because everything is genetically related so it is not that on the whole we'll be able to alter the entire thing but yes to a large extent the uh, severity of the disease would be corrected but that doesn't mean that we take a free hand with regard to the risk factors hmm? alter doesn't mean that disease will not manifest the, the intensity would be reduced mm. sir in foreign countries gene therapy is used as decreasing the biological age reverse aging through microbiome test is it good so i'll be turning 46 at the in august this year so in case uh, ipad ipad has written in case this thing you get to know please let me know also okay so i would love to be 36 again or something of that sort okay in which my age appears a little lesser as said but from what i know nutri genomics is something which is in play so there are a lot of collagen supplements etc which they say that if we take keep on taking regularly especially with regard to collagen they say what happens is on the whole the aging process is uh, what do you say st not stopped reduced to a certain extent on the other hand with regard to aging especially skin wrinkling etc they say factors like smoking and especially alcohol intake they have a lot of effect with regard to the aging process of the face now many a times when we talk about age we talk about general appearance and vitality of a person aging is again multi genetic thing so you cannot say the entire thing will be reversed that sort of thing uh, there are diseases in which um, a person ages very fast but uh, i think that uh, funny case of uh, what was that movie benedict something in which he was born old and then he uh, died as a child i have not come across any age but yes again in case this microbiome test is helpful you have my email and whatsapp please let me know at the earliest okay as far as i am aware and it is not there okay so again moving on to the next this thing okay so i think that was it with regard to the questions ma'am so again um, like thanks a lot again ma'am for especially this innovative this thing of uh, uh, everybody attending because it looks like we are presenting a talk or a seminar then otherwise everybody uh, sitting individually with their laptops closed or something so then what happens is you are not very sure that whether the students are even physically present forget about mentally present or not so here it is a big big motivation ma'am thanks a lot i see a lot of nodding faces smiling faces etc so generally that nodding and the smiling is an indication for the speaker to say bye bye etc but still Uh, thanks a lot for this uh, arrangement ma'am i just hope ma'am that in the last uh, almost one and a half hour few points i was able to get across and ma'am again for the benefit of the students uh, what i'll do is i'll convert this thing into a pdf it will be easier to share 
and i'll send you the pdf over whatsapp ma'am the entire lecture which i have taken so then the students at least an outline they'll be getting from writing in the answers point of view ma'am so i might be having a pdf already if it is fine ma'am i'll just share it with you ma'am dr nayan there is a question from Asia. Okay, ma'am. Uh, sir, it has come. Okay, in foreign countries. Um, and not. Okay, open. Yeah, yeah. Please. Okay, sir. It is not there in the chat box. Fine. Please, okay. sir. Uh, this is regarding talking about uh, inflammatory side effects and anti-inflammatory side effects. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It was some of the literature we study. Uh, I came across this terminology. I will tell. Functional deficiency of IL-10 as an intact counter. Functional deficiency of interleukin-10, sir. Yeah, interleukin-10. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes. So, this, naturally... Uh, this is... Uh, I uh, just wanted to know what makes it functionally deficient. This sir... Is, uh, uh, okay. Sir, whenever we are talking about uh, a, a functional deficiency of an interleukin, okay? sir... Uh, just like I said, we have missense mutation and we have nonsense mutation. Missense mutation basically means that the quantity of, I'll talk specifically with regard to interleukin 10, the quantity of interleukin 10 secreted is the same. But on the whole, its effect, its efficacy has reduced, meaning a deficient or defective quality of interleukin 10 has been produced. That is the meaning of functional deficiency. On the other hand, nonsense mutation would be that because of the genetic defect, the quantity of interleukin 10 produced has been reduced. So again, genetic defects that is mutation can either lead to decrease or increase in the quantity. In the case of pro-inflammatory cytokines, increased quantity would be harmful. In the case of anti-inflammatory cytokines, a decreased quantity would be harmful. That is nonsense. Missense or functional deficiency basically generally refers to that the protein, that the enzyme, sorry, the inflammatory mediator is secreted in the normal quantity, but the efficacy is not there of reducing the inflammation, sir. That is my interpretation, sir, of this thing, term. Okay. Um, yes, seeking the blessings of our holiness, I would first of all like to thank the management and our principal, Dr. Dakshani, who encouraged me to carry on with this topic, which she said is going to have a lot of future to it and people can start doing some research on it. And uh, the thing is, uh, I am also extremely uh, happy that you have agreed to come and do this webinar just by asking you casually on the phone. And we have never personally met, except I've attended one of your lectures on genetics in a conference in Nagpur. And that's when I felt you would be an ideal person to invite our BDs and bring it to a simpler term. And since that day, it has always been on my mind that I should uh, contact you. And it's only through WhatsApp we have been having contact. I, I have never otherwise met, and I don't think you also know me that well. Uh, anyway, thank you very much. And for the first years, it's a bird eye view on genetics, they would have been running away from it. Now at least you have made it simpler and make it more uh, easier for them to go back and uh, not run away and refer the chapter. And for the third years, I am 100% sure you have helped them in knowing what is important exam point of view and how to go about it. And uh, yeah, I, I really uh, think this has been a very useful uh, webinar. And I was also quite surprised that there are my own students who have also requested whether they could join. 
and some other staff from other colleges and things like that. So uh, I am really happy it is of use to everybody. And uh, uh, I, as far as I know, not all, uh, yeah, all of us are teachers, but very few are dedicated and who are able to bring down the topic to a simpler terms for the students. That is a real gift which I really admire. So uh, wishing you all the best and hoping that we will one day meet and uh, I will continue with this um, uh, collaborations and things like that. So uh, thank you once again. And I thank my staff members who have been a big uh, support to me, especially when I was sick. And Dr. Avinash, who has taken over, uh, helped me with all this webinar uh, thing. Uh, I was actually not sure whether I would be able to make it, but I so badly wanted to be here. So uh, I thank, thank you once again, and all my staff and students. I hope it has been of use, and you will continue to be in touch with Sir, us, clear your doubts. Whatever you have, you feel free because he is a person I feel who can, who is always uh, free to help people and Never. who have uh, brought about so many educative videos, which that's the part that made me to uh, keep it. Yeah. He used to send me all the videos. Yeah, that, that. So, uh, hey guys. Thank you very much. Um, Hope we'll see again. And I thank the supporting staff also for keeping this room ready and the technical uh, things ready. And my interns also who helped me. And uh, my uh, PD in comms, who's uh, Dr. Sumo, who has helped in making the certificates and uh, all this uh, web handling. She is the one who has arranged it. So I would convey my greetings and thanks to them. Uh, handing over to Dr. Avinash. Honor for me, ma'am. Honor for me. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Uh, I think this talk is complete with them. So, I've uh, joined online to uh, send in your email ID so that we can uh, post the certificates. And also, Dr. Mayur, I think we are sharing the e certificate to your, uh, to your email ID. Okay, sir. Okay, sir. We can access that. Share it. Yeah, we'll be sending you the certificate. Okay. Okay. So that, thank you so much. Thank you everyone for joining. I will back to the meeting now. Hi, thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, thank you, Dr. Vinay. Thank you, students. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am.